uh, to chair the second part of our first day. Uh, we'll have uh, two uh, contributed papers and one uh, um, invited one. Uh, the first two will have uh, a half an hour time for presentation and maybe 10 minutes for discussion. Whereas the senior one, or so to speak senior, because our uh, invited uh, speaker of uh, today, uh, uh, will have uh, uh, an hour uh, on the whole, I mean uh, for 45 minutes and uh, um, the usual quarter of an hour uh, discussion. Uh, we are already 10 minutes late, which isn't that dramatic for Italian standards. So, uh, I'm very happy to present our first speaker of today, uh, Leo Town Townsend, am, am I right? Um, as he was saying, uh, uh, South African is an origin, but uh, uh, completing his uh, uh, PhD thesis at the University of Oslo, um, he's a lot of interest, I've a uh, little bit looked uh, on uh, in uh, uh, Google uh, and I don't want to uh, mention all of them. He is, uh, uh, anyway, giving uh, a um, presentation on joint commit commitments and collective belief, a revisionary proposal. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so in this talk, I'm going to revisit a debate over Margaret Gilbert's account of collective belief. I admire Gilbert's account a lot, but I think it faces quite a serious problem. So I want to offer what I think is a friendly suggestion for Gilbert, and I hope that she sees it that way too, but I doubt that she will. So as we know, Gilbert thinks that collective entities, or plural subjects as she calls them, can have genuine beliefs. Here is her account of collective belief, that's not. <clears throat> the members of a population, P, collectively believe that P, if and only if they are jointly committed to believe that P as a body. This account has been opposed by Gilbert's so-called rejectionist critics. They don't deny that Gilbert's work in this area picks out a real and important and interesting phenomenon, but they're called rejectionists because they reject the idea that what Gilbert calls collective belief deserves to be called belief. Instead they claim, or they usually claim, it's a different cognitive state, the state of acceptance. I think we should not be rejectionists about Gilbert's account of collective belief, but rather, as it were, revisionists. So I'm going to argue, in the first part of this paper, that Gilbert's account as it stands could not be an account of collective, of something properly called belief. The reason why is not quite the same as the reason that's been given by rejectionists, and it's got something to do with the way she construes joint commitment in the account. Then, in the second part of the talk, I'll present a revised version of Gilbert's account. The revised account of collective belief still involves a joint commitment, but not of the kind that Gilbert favors. I call it a collective doxastic commitment. It is not a collective it is not a joint commitment to believe that P is a body, but a joint commitment to P as true. Okay, so let's try and get the account into view, and I think an example helps. Here's one of Gilbert's examples. Ross personally believes that it is never justified for one country to take up arms against another. When Mark asserts the justifiability of a defensive war, he speaks very forcefully. Rather than argue, Ross decides to agree with him. So she says, yes, indeed. It seems now that either of them could probably make the collective belief statement, we believe that a defensive war is justified. And this is true even if Mark was for some reason asserting the opposite of his personal view when he spoke. In other words, it may be true for Ross and Mark that we believe that P 
though neither of them personally believes that he. So what happens in cases like this? Well, one important feature is that there's some kind of exchange between the parties, wherein each expresses his or her readiness to let some view, some proposition stand as their collective view. In this example, Mark signals his readiness by making an assertion, and Ross signals hers by assenting. Once an exchange of that sort has taken place, what Gilbert calls collective belief statements are then seen as appropriate. For example, either Ross or Mark could appropriately say, we believe that a defensive war is justified. And presumably an outsider who witnessed their exchange could say that of them. Another thing which this example uh, makes very clear is the possibility of divergence. So, of the collective belief from the beliefs of the members of the collective. It can be true of Ros and Mark that they believe a defensive war is justified, even though neither of them personally hold that belief. And finally, and this doesn't come very, out very clearly in the um, uh, portion that I quoted, but it is perhaps the most important feature of collective belief for Gilbert, as I read her. Is there a problem with the sound? No? Okay, okay, okay. <clears throat> and this is the normative situation, the internal normative situation introduced by a collective belief. Gilbert sometimes calls this the package of rights. Each party to a collective belief owes it to all of the others to speak and act in ways that accord with them believing that he is a body. So although no party needs to pretend, and Gilbert's very clear about this, nobody needs to pretend that they personally uh, believe that he, each must declare we believe a, just, a defensive war is justified when appropriate. And they shouldn't express direct disagreement with that claim uh, except without what Gilbert calls preamble. So, for example, say, well, I personally do not believe the defense of is justified. Should either of them fail to meet these obligations, the other has the standing to rebuke the offending party. <clears throat> so Gilbert accounts for this normative situation with the notion of joint commitment. Like personal commitments, joint commitments are sources of normative constraint and standing. So here's an example of personal commitment. Jim decides to go to the party, and then he is committed to going, which means, all else being equal, that he ought to go. He also has a certain kind of standing in relation to himself. He's answerable to himself for going or failing to go. And this means that he could appropriately chide or rebuke himself should he fail to go and help by forgetting. Likewise, in the case of joint commitment, if Beth and Sue jointly commit to walking together, then all else being equal, they ought to take a walk together. Each owes it to the other to play her part in their seeing to it that they take a walk together. And each also has the correlative standing to rebuke the other should, should she fail to participate in the right way. So a joint commitment is thus, like a personal commitment, a normatively significant process of self-binding, except, except that the self in question is a plural subject. By reciproc reciprocally expressing readiness to let a defense of war's justified stand as their collective view, Mark and Ross bind themselves to believing that a defense of war is justified as a single body. And since such a commitment seems to explain the distinctive obligations and entitlements that Mark and Ross have in relation to one another, Gilbert's proposal is that this sort of commitment constitutes this sort of belief. I now turn to um, the claim made by Gilbert's rejectionist critics, okay, that the phenomenon picked out in examples like this one of Ros and Mark could not be of the phenomenon of genuine belief. There are two main reasons that have been given for that claim. The first is that the collective view 
seems to be formed for reasons unrelated to its truth. But genuine belief must, we are always told, aim at truth. <clears throat> Looking at the case of Ros and Mark, the idea might be something like this. Since neither Ros nor Mark take the collective view that a defense of war is justified to be true, it could not be the case that they collectively believe it. Perhaps instead they are only going along with it or accepting the view, where this sort of attitude, that attitude of acceptance, needn't aim at truth in quite the same way that belief does. Another consideration sometimes given is that neither Ros nor Mark seem to be motivated to let that view, the view that the defense of war is justified, stand as their view for reasons that pertain to its truth. The second sort of family of reasons uh, rejectionists have given is that the collective view seems to be brought about voluntarily, and as we're always told, belief cannot be willed. In the case of Ros and Mark, this seems fairly plausible. All it takes, according to Gilbert, for it to be true of Ros and Mark that they believe a defense of war is justified, is two perfectly voluntary acts. But if Mark's assertion, that's his voluntary act, and Ros's assent, hers, are all it takes for a collective belief to be formed between them, then it seems possibly maybe that since these two ingredients are both produced voluntarily, the collective belief is produced voluntarily. That's the rejection of critique. Now, of course, Gilbert has given um, replies to these and other rejectionist worries. <clears throat> the short version of her reply is that what goes for Ros on the one hand and Mark on the other hand does not necessarily go for Ros and Mark, the, the plural subject. Slightly more fully, in terms of the charge that collective belief does not aim at truth in the right way, Gilbert claims that just because Ros on the one hand and Mark on the other hand do not personally take it to be true that a defense of war is justified, it doesn't follow that, a collect that they do not collectively take it to be true. And the same goes for the charge that collective belief is produced voluntarily. Just because Ros's participation in the collective belief is voluntary, as is Mark's, it does not follow that the collective belief produced between them is collectively willed. That is, willed by them qua plural subject. <clears throat> well, I find these replies from Gilbert adequate, but somehow unsatisfying. And I don't think I'm alone. So what I'm going to try and do is a different tactic. <clears throat> Instead of doing what rejectionists have done, which is focus on the phenomenon picked out in Gilbert's examples, I want to look more closely at the joint commitment Gilbert uses to account for that phenomenon. In particular, I want to look at the object of that commitment. And by the object of the commitment, what I mean is that which it is a commitment to. In the case of collective belief, according to the account I put up earlier, this is believing that P is a body. How should we understand that? Well, here's something that Gilbert has said, and she said earlier as well. Joint commitments are always commitments to act as a body, where acting is taken in a broad sense, um, so as to include the having of psychological states. This means that we should interpret the object of the joint commitment in Gilbert's account in what we might call an attitude-centered way, rather than a content-centered way. That is, what the participants in the collective belief jointly commit to is the having of the belief that P, rather than to P itself. This, to my mind, is where the problem in Gilbert's account lies. You can begin to see the problem by noting that in the individual case, a person can fully commit to the having of a belief that P and not yet believe that P. Perhaps I recognize that, all things considered, the belief that my PhD dissertation is going along nicely would be a good belief for me to have, would be good for my family too. Um, and so for this reason, I commit to believing that my work is going along nicely. This might amount to some kind of attitude. It might amount to intending to bring it about that I believe 
that my work is going along nicely, but it does not yet amount to the belief. In the collective case, I think the same sort of trouble arises. I think it is to do with the different kinds of reasons we might have for jointly committing to the having of a belief as compared with reasons for belief. What I mean by this, by this is that there are some reasons, reasons which show that the belief that P would be good to have, which when found fully convincing, would be enough to forge the joint commitment to believe that P as a body. For example, our believing that P might be the friendliest option in a situation where friendliness is all that matters. But committing ourselves to the belief that P for this reason is not yet to believe that P. Because we have not yet broached the matter of whether or not P. There are reasons which, when found fully convincing, would amount to the belief that P. But these are reasons that bear on the truth of P, not whether believing that P would be good for us to do. So I think Gilbert's account does face a problem of broadly the same sort that rejectionists have uh, charged her with. But since the problem seems to be generated by the way she construes joint commitment, perhaps what's called for is not an outright rejection of the account, but rather a revision of that construal. So in the rest of the paper, I'm going to draw on some recent work by Pamela Hieronymi to briefly explore this possibility. <coughs> So, Hieronymi describes belief as what she calls a commitment-constituted attitude. What she means by this is that an attitude of belief is the sort of thing which can be formed or revised simply, that is, ipso facto, by committing oneself to an answer to a particular sort of question. Here she says, if you settle for yourself the question of whether P, she means settle positively. You have thus, ipso facto, formed a belief that P. <clears throat> As we have seen, Gilbert too thinks that a certain kind of belief, that is a collective belief, is constituted by a certain kind of commitment, that is a joint commitment to believing that P is a body. This is why I think Hieronymy's notion of belief might be of some help for Gilbert. <clears throat> Gilbert Gilbert's problem arose from what I call the attitude-centered reading of the joint commitment she sees as constitutive of collective belief. What Hieronymy offers is a content-centered understanding of the commitment that constitutes that belief. And this avoids the problems which I take guilt to face. So here is the revised version of Gilbert's account, which I want to propose. The members of the population, P, collectively believe that P, if and only if they are jointly committed to P as true. That is, they have jointly settled for themselves, positively, the question of whether P. So that's the idea I want to try out. And for the remainder of the paper, I'm going to sort of fill it out a little bit and then very, very briefly try to assess it. <clears throat> so, one thing we need to find out is what it is for a set of individuals to be jointly committed to P as true, to have between them a collective doxastic commitment. On my proposal, they must have settled for themselves the question of whether P. And actually it turns out that how this can happen is, su is suggested by one of Gilbert's own examples. <clears throat> and I've tried to make this shorter, but I can't, I can't make it shorter without losing some aspect of the sense, so bear with the long example. So there are three states in a particular alliance, represented by Peter, Antoine, and Carl. Previously, the alliance had come to believe that the way to achieve its goal, G, was to bomb country C. Or for short, it had come to believe that G. So small g is the proposition that the way for the, the alliance to achieve its goal is to bomb country C. <coughs> Now each member prefers, for its own reasons, that the alliance's bombing of C be discontinued, but therefore wants to bring it about that the alliance cease to believe that G. <clears throat> Carl speaks first in the name of his own country. He is quite likely to say, is bombing C really going to achieve G? 
In other words, he is likely to question the truth of G. Peter might appropriately say, it's not clear that it is. I'd say that bombing isn't likely to achieve G, given the, the people we're up against. It's just as likely to have the opposite effect. Carl and Antoine might eagerly approve this, thus establishing for the Alliance a new collective belief. Now Gilbert asks, given this scenario, on what basis did the Alliance give up, give up its belief at G? It did so for this reason. Given the character of the people the Alliance is up against, the bombing of C is not, after all, likely to achieve goal G. I think that's a great example. Gilbert uses the example to show that a group can form or revise a group view for what we might call properly epistemic reasons. <clears throat> Even when the reasons of the individuals for forming or revising the group view are prudential or practical, that is, non-epistemic. So even when the participatory motives of group members are of the wrong kind for belief, the group itself might believe for the right kind of reasons. That seems absolutely correct to me. What seems wrong, however, is what Gilbert's account implies about how we should characterize what is going on in the example. It seems quite wrong to me to think that what the delegates are doing is jointly committing to believing not G as a body. For it is not the collective belief that G which they are discussing, but rather the matter of G. In Hieronymian terms, the delegates are engaged in the joint activity of settling a question. But it is not the question of whether they should go on believing that G, but the question of G itself. It seems legitimate to my mind to call the outcome of that inquiry, their discussion, the forging of a commitment. But the sort of commitment forged is a commitment to P as true, not a commitment to the having of the belief that P. So I think this example, anyway, supports the revised account over the original. To end off, I will very incredibly briefly try to assess this revised, this revised account of the proposal. First, I want to ask a question which we might call one of explanatory ad adequacy. <clears throat> Is the revised account able to vindicate all of Gilbert's examples of so-called collective belief? The answer is actually no. Although the revised account is consonant with the example of the political alliance, it does not deliver the same verdict in cases like the case of Ras and Mark. That is because Ras and Mark, unlike the political alliance, do not seem to be in the business of settling for themselves a question of the form whether or not P. So the revised account would side with Gilbert's critics in rejecting theirs as a case of genuine belief. This is so even if, as Gilbert suggests, we are apt pre-theoretically to understand a case like the case of Ros and Mark as a case of belief, to use collective belief statements and so on. So the revised account I'm proposing is also a somewhat revisionary account because it requires, in some cases, that we revise our intuitive judgments. But since these cases are already very much in dispute, this is not obviously a drawback on my proposal, it may even be a virtue. The next criterion of assessment <coughs> concerns the explanatory resources of the revised account. In particular, we can ask, is it able to account for the main feature of collective belief that Gilbert observes? That is, the internal normative situation in a believing group, the package of rights. I realize I haven't said enough about the notion of doxastic commitment, but I think the answer here would be yes. <clears throat> a commitment to be is true just as much as a practical commitment is a source of normative constraint and standing. For example, being committed to P as true makes one liable to certain challenges to P and obliged to provide reasons of the right sort when challenged. It also gives one the normative standing, I think, to assert that P. And when there is 
a joint commitment to P as true, that is a collective doxastic commitment, there will also be distinctive individual obligations and entitlements for the parties in relation to one another. Directed duties, as we sometimes call them. They will need to see to it that they all speak and act in ways that accord with their collective commitment to P as true. Finally, I want to ask whether the revised account could be accepted by Gilbert herself. I started out by uh, calling this a friendly suggestion, but I'm not sure she'll take it that way. And one could worry that she could not accept it, because it doesn't cohere with the rest of her philosophical project. The answer to, the answer to this question is that I'm not really sure, I don't know. As her recent book makes very clear, Gilbert wants to account for many facets of the social world using the very same construal of joint commitment. The construal which sees the object of joint commitment as always some kind of acting as a body, where acting is broadly construed. I am proposing she gives up this construal for the case of collective beliefs, also possibly collective intentions, but I haven't said anything about that yet. <coughs> I don't think there would be anything cons inconsistent in her doing that, but my guess is that she would prefer not to. So to sum, sum up, <clears throat> I've said that Gilbert's account as it stands faces a problem. Collective beliefs can be formed in ways unbecoming of belief proper. But I think that the account can be saved, it need be rejected, it can be revised, so that the joint commitment at the heart of their account is a collective doxastic commitment rather than a practical one. Thanks. Thank you, Leo, for this really neatly argued um, presentation. And in fact, uh, well, uh, a phenomenologist uh, would say that, in fact, uh, uh, it's because of the intentional structure of belief that uh, you can possibly commit yourself to believe anything you, you'd like to. But uh, uh, this is a nice one, I find, and please, I, I, I hope that, uh, first of all, maybe Margaret and then the other ones. Uh, yeah, I, I you know, I think I'd rather step back because I'm going to have a session at the end of the conference and at the okay. same time I'd like to hear what other people have oh. to say and also we can talk a bit, so okay. let's do that. Okay, then we have, uh, uh, thank you for being so concise, in fact, we have 10 minutes left for discussion. I just um, kind of one question that I'm left with is um, it seems like one thing that you could say in favor of the view that that you're kind of Margaret's view you're criticizing that as a group what we're doing to or as what we're doing as a group is deciding whether or not we will believe that P is that it's something distinct from what we're doing at an individual level when we decide whether or not P. And the way you're constrained, it seems that we as individuals have maybe have already settled for ourselves whether or not P. And now as a group, we're settling whether or not P. And I'm wondering, if you can explain a little bit about how that works. How can I be part of a group that's trying to decide whether or not P if I already, as an individual, settle by myself whether or not P? And could those two decisions have different outcomes? Okay, thanks. That's, a, that's an important question. So, so just before you give the microphone away, are you asking that whether what I called uh, the possibility of divergence, um, which is definitely a feature of Gilbert's account, um, is kept intact by my revised account. In other words, whether we can still have the possibility that possibly all of uh, members of the collective um, hold a view that's opposite of what the collective belief is. Yeah, essentially I'm asking whether or not that's possible on your review, but also whether you can construe it in a way that's possible. I think it's possible. 
So I think in this respect, uh, the revised account is the same as, as the old um, What was the, I'm not quite sure why you, do you think that that's not, that's not right? Well, I'm just wondering if I as an individual am yeah. considering whether P, yeah. that's a decision that I make on my own. And yeah. then if we're together talking about whether P, how, how, is, how is it that we together can come to decide whether P is true, if I've already decided for myself whether P is true. What does that decision consist in that we're not making? Well, okay, I think I need to think a little further about this. I mean, one thing to say is that there will be this phenomenon which Gilbert calls doxastic coercion um, in, a, in a group <clears throat> where the individuals have, may have settled for themselves the question of P. Um, but then they reopen the question as a group and perhaps settle it in a way uh, which doesn't align with some or most or all of uh, the members' beliefs um, vis a vis P. Um, what will happen is that I think it's inevitable that the individuals will need to themselves revisit their personal beliefs vis a vis P. I haven't, I haven't said why I think there's still the possibility of divergence, but I think there is. <laughs> okay. okay, thanks. Sylvia. Please present yourself. Uh, I'm Sylvia Tsut from uh, Santa Fe University. Uh, just a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is uh, connected to the previous one. And uh, just, I was wondering. Uh, exactly about the possibility of divergence because if uh, we accept your revision the, that uh, collective belief means the commitment to P as true then we cannot really explain the possibility of uh, inconsistency among personal beliefs and collective beliefs because after a discussion with, uh, between uh, the members of the group I would be convinced by epistemic reasons that uh, G is the best belief I could have about uh, a certain argument. So I cannot have this kind of uh, disagreement within I think this, uh, if you think about knowledge, this is particularly clear. If you think uh, a discussion purely epistemic among scientists and at the end of the discussion they decide that G is the best explanation for example and they come to knowledge that P, then it's really hard to say that there may be a divergence among the personal and collective beliefs. It's quite strange, at least. I think that we should say something about this. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm not very troubled by the sort of example you've just given. I'm more troubled with the possibility of, as it were, total divergence. So let me just say why I think that it's perfectly possible um, on my revised account of collective belief, um, why how um, it could be that some uh, of the group members continue to hold a, a belief that not be when, when the, the, the set of them, the group, has gone through this process of settling the question of the positive and, thumb, and done so positively. Um, I mean, it just seems it just seems fairly obvious to me that that, and I think this is a feature of many real world um, collective epistemic endeavors that uh, we can settle a question one way as a group, and yet some members of the group can hold opposite view or no view at all on the matter. I mean, that's slightly easier to see because the, the group view could just be an implication from um, some, some premises um, formed in a certain way within the group. Um, yeah. I, I'm not going to have anything there now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. John. Thank you. It's really just following up on that. I mean, I found it extremely interesting, your, your, your paper, and very plausible. 
Um, I will just give you an example and see if this was helpful or not and what you wanted to say about it. Uh, members of the government, for example, uh, they're often uh, required to, to have a collective view about something. So they, uh, they debate together or whatever, and then a decision is made that the government believes X. But of course, individual uh, members of the government may well not believe X. So what, I mean, is that, is that, is that a supportive example of the kind of view you want to, to defend, or is it, is, it, is it kind of problematic? Okay, thank you. That, that's very helpful, actually. I, I think the answer to that depends on more details. So, so I think what, I, what I've been concerned to do here is distinguish between two kinds of collective epistemic enterprise or question settling. Okay, and I think that both both occur. But I think that the mistake rejectionists have made <coughs> is thinking that it's inevitable that. Um, uh, the formation of a collective belief must be of, of the one kind. So, so the one kind is the sort of uh, cynical scenario of Ross and Mark. Okay. So what happens there is that there's a discussion and, and Ross just, I mean, Mark maybe just wants to be provocative or annoying and, and Ross just wants to avoid an altercation. Um, it's, it seems to me that there, there's no possible way that you could see what happens there as them together, genuinely, earnestly settling the question of whether a defensive war is justified. But you can contrast that with the case of the political alliance. You might think that there's a kind of cynical undercurrent in that case too, but 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 yeah, okay. Um, but on its face, what goes on in the discussion between Carl and Tuan and Peter is is a discussion um, that bears on the truth of a, of a proposition. So they, they amongst themselves they develop a reason why not G. And it's a reason of the right kind. So all I want to all I want to say is that for those sorts of cases, we can have an account of um, collective belief in terms of this notion of collective doxastic commitment. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think that we can talk more. Oh, yeah. This is, this is just a short observation linking, linking up with that of John. Uh, from real life, not from, uh, from philosophers, but from real life. I think as far as divergence is concerned, making up, one, making up, making up one's, one's collective mind, distinction has to be made between informal groups and formal groups. For the second, for the latter, for formal groups, a word comes in which is quite important in Professor Gilman's book, which is mouthpiece. We think that P means the mouthpiece of the formal group says P, that P. This is the case with governments, for instance, or other committee, committees or other formal groups. Whereas in the case of an informal group, uh, after we've struggled to make up our collective mind on whether P or not P, if we do arrive at the result that we believe, do believe that P, this means simply not that the mouthpiece, mouthpiece thinks or says it's P because there's no mouthpiece by hypotheses but that most of us believe in that P and that most of us know that most of us believe that P. But this is not a, a case which is probably not so interesting for you as the case as is the case of former groups where there is a mouthpiece and an official standpoint which is a binding norm, which has a very, very strong normative connotation to it. It's not just someone's opinion because this opinion might be shared by virtually nobody in the group, but it's the official, uh, it's the official standpoint of the mouthpiece. The former group, like the government. Okay, this is real life. This that's an interesting observation. Uh, there's something you said which I would still want to resist. Um, correct me if I've got you wrong. Uh, have you just said that in an informal group, what it, what it means when we make up our mind collectively or we together settle a question about whether or not P is that it turns out that most or all of us end up holding the view. 
I want to resist that sort of summative picture for my revised account just as much as Gilbert wants to resist. Yes, I know. I know. Okay, so you're just great. Okay. And show me. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, my name is Sonia Rinov-Nakreda from Graz University. Um, my question uh, is a follow-up to the previous question, namely, um, what is the distinction between uh, a, a belief formation uh, of a single person and uh, a belief uh, within a group situation? I think uh, we, we could find arguments uh, to figure out the distinction um, without giving up this very important distinction you made, namely between a uh, collective success, the commitment uh, in favor of uh, the truth of people uh, on the one hand and the collective commitment to belief. What uh, we really gain uh, in case of the group situation, in my view, is that uh, we have a much more better chance to get uh, a large variety of possible counter evidences with regard to our BVP. And this means we get a better chance to check whether our belief is true. That's a group. Uh, as a group, yeah. but as a toxastic collective commitment. So there seems to be a clear advantage in the group situation in terms of uh, that we have a uh, better chance to, to think about possible disagreements and analyze disagreements uh, in order to strengthen our belief or test our belief. Okay, thanks very much. I mean, I, I'm quite sympathetic to the various claims that have been made um, about the epistemic advantages of uh, collective uh, decision making. Um, so, is that what you're thinking? What you, what, 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 what you, the point you're making? Yes. Yeah, and I think. Um, or that presupposes that there is a genuine uh, epistemic inquiry going on, which I think is the sort of thing that uh, Gilbert's rejectionist critics um, are, are skeptical about the very possibility of. Okay, so I think what you said is very much in line with my yeah. Thank you. I would suggest that we stop here because uh, 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 we, we just run out of time. Thank you very much. Please.